So in this next video on probability, we'll be focusing on how to find the probability of events not happening, the different types of probability, probability notation, and what is meant by relative frequency. So continuing on the last video on looking at basic probability, now another common question you could get asked in tests and exams is finding the probability of something that does not happen. Now to find the probability of, uh, of an event that does not happen, we can use the following rule. So the probability of an event not happening is equal to 1 minus the probability of it happening. So if we take this example um, to kind of get an understanding of what this actually means, so a bag contains 18 counters where four of them are red. A counter is picked at random. What is the probability that it is not read? Now, I can't stress this enough for how important it is to read mathematical questions correctly. So try not to guess what the questions have been asking. So you think, oh, probability question, 18 counters, 4 red, answers 4 out of 18. But because it's questions asking what's the probability of not being read, we kind of need to delve into this question a little bit more. So the first we need to know is if that there are 18 counters four of them are red so therefore that means that 18 minus 4 which is 14 are not red so that means that the answer then is going to be 14 out of 18 which simplifies to give me 7 over 9. now using this formula another way of working this out so the probability of it not being red is equal to 1 minus the probability of it being read, which is 4 over 18. And again, if I type that into my calculator or wanted to work it out, so if 4 over 18, that means that there's 14 left out of 18. And then you go on to simplify that, which again gives you the exact same answer of 7 over 9. So looking at another two examples, so this question says that a class has 32 students, 20 are boys. If a child is picked at random, what is the probability that they are not a boy? So again, using the formula, so the probability of it not being a boy is equal to 1 minus the probability of it being a boy. So if I was to type that into my calculator or work it out, I get an answer of 12 over 32, which simplifies to be 6 over 16 which sim simplifies to be 3 over 8. Now, again, another way of working this out is you kind of use your common sense. Well, if 20 are boys, then 12 are not boys. So therefore, then the answer is going to be 12 over 32, which again simplifies to give me 3 over 8 as your final answer. Now the next question then says, so a 10-sided die is rolled, what is the probability that when rolled it lands on a number that is not prime? So if I again for a 10-sided die, so if I just write down the numbers that it could be, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Now if I just make a note of the prime numbers, so 2 is prime, 3 is prime, 5 is prime, 7 is prime, and I look at the numbers that aren't prime, so that's 1, 7, 6, 8, 9, and 10. So the probability of it not being prime is equal to, and it's going to be 6 out of 10, which simplifies to be 3 over 5. Now, another alternative way is to use the formula. So the probability of it not being prime is equal to 1 minus the probability of it being prime, which is 1 minus. 4 out of 10, which gives me the answer of 6 over 10, which simplifies to give me 3 over 5. And again, it's entirely up to you which method you choose. As long as you get the right method and the right answer, uh, that's all that matters. So moving on to the next part, which is looking at probability words and notations. Now, these are some of the key things that you kind of need to be aware that are slowly being asked in more modern exams. Now, the first one is independent events. Now, independent events are events where the outcome of one event happening has no impact on the probability of another happening. So, for example, me having toast for breakfast and you having toast for breakfast, there is no impact that me having the probability of me having toast or um, is going to have no impact on you having toast unless you're living in the same house or whatever. We're not going to go down that route. Um, so, but yeah, so basically two events where one is completely unconnected to another is not going to be the case. So for example, uh, events that could be 
independent uh, that could be not independent would be you waking up late and being late for school because obviously you think the time that they are going to be connected so if you wake up late there's a good chance you're going to be late for school now the next type of the next type of event you can have is what we call mutually exclusive events now mutually exclusive events are events that cannot happen at the same time so at events that can't happen at the same time is you rolling a die and getting a two and a four OK, because that's going to be impossible because you can only get one number at a time. Now, it's really good in your revision to have an idea of what these two things mean. So have an example of independent events, have an example of two events that aren't independent, have an example of events that are mutually exclusive and have an example of things that aren't mutually exclusive. And so and when it comes to notation, now this is where little symbols that come in. So, for example, this little U shape or shoehorn you could say basically represents or so if you have something the lines of this working out then basically what that means that's the probability of a or b now if you have something that looks like an n so let's say you had something that looks like this then basically what you're asked to find is the probability of a and B so the two things happening at the same time so then moving on to the different types of probability you can have so there are two different types so the first type is what we call theoretical probability now theoretical probability and this is when maths is used in particular the formula that was covered in the previous video to calculate the probability of an event happening so for example if you chose someone at random and you wanted to guess what day they were born um, the probability of that they were born on a Monday, well, there's only one Monday in a week and there are seven possible different days you could be born on. So the answer is going to be one over seven. Now, looking at experimental probability, now experimental probability, this is where probability is based on recorded data or data that's recorded from an experiment. So, for example, let's say we recorded the births of 88 babies. OK, so here is a list of 88 babies and we've recorded what day they were born on. Now, based on this information, the probability that a child is born on a Monday, well, 12 were born on a Monday out of 88 babies. So the probability then is going to be 12 over 88, which is 6 over 44, which is 3 over 22. So you can see how these two probabilities are different. So one is theoretical where you're using pure maths to work out the probability and experimental probability is when you're using recorded data or data that's already been collected and then using those numbers to work out what the prob probability is going to be. Now, relative frequency, this is when we use probability to estimate the number of times an event occurs after n number of given trials. Now, n is just basically any number. So after 10, 20, 30, 40, 500, 6 million. So it doesn't matter how many trials you do, it's basically after a given number of times. So for example, let's say we wanted to work, we're going to roll a die 250 times just because it's fun. And we want to work out how many times would we expect the die to land on a five. Now, the general rule for relative frequency is this. It's the probability of the event. Multiplied by the number of trials. So in this first example, here we've got the probability of getting a five, which is going to be one over six. And I'm going to multiply that by the number of times I'm rolling the die. Now, if I type that into my calculator, one sixth multiplied by 250, I get an answer of 41.6666667 times. Now I'm going to round that up to 42 Time. So that's how many times I would expect that if I rolled a die 250 times, I would expect to roughly to get around a 542 times. Now, in another question, it says that a room contains 860 people. How many people would you expect to have a birthday in the summer? So again, what we want to do is first of all, work out the probability that person is born in the summer. So looking at that, we've got four seasons where one of them is summer. So that's going to be one over four. And again, I'm going to multiply that by the number of people that I've got, which is 860. So we're not looking at trials, we're looking at people in this case. So if I do a quarter times 860, 
I get an answer of 215 people. Now, going back to the probability of it being summer, so if I just make a little note of that, so that's the probability of it being summer. Another way to look at it is, well, how many months are there in summer? Well, there's three months out of 12, which again gives you a quarter. So you might look at it in difference. You might just not think of seasons. So one out of the four seasons is summer. You might think about it in months, where three out of 12 months are in summer. But again, you can see how the probability of it being summer is exactly the same, whichever way you decide to work it out. Now, moving on to another question. So it says that a six-sided die is rolled 50 times and the table shows the number of times a die landed on each number. Now, it then says that L thinks that the die is biased. Is she correct? Explain your answer. Now, when you roll a die, I would say more than 30 times, then you would expect roughly, if it's a fair die, for your numbers to be exactly the same or close to each other, at least that. So you can see here that the numbers that stand out are the three and the five. So is the die bias? Well, I would say, yes, she is correct. And the reason why it's bias, and it's always good to write a reason, because we have a less number of threes and a much higher number of fives than any other, which are two words, not one, so I don't know why I'm doing that, than any other number. And again, another reason you could write is for it not to be biased, the number of times each number lands should be the same. And there you go. So a little bit more extra detail than we probably need, but we go, there you go. Now the next part then says that the same die is rolled 2,400 times. How many times would you expect the die to land on a five? So looking at these numbers from this table, we can see that the probability of it landing on a five is going to be five, uh, 19. Let's get rid of that. So it's going to be 19 out of 50. And we're going to multiply that by the number of times that we're rolling it, which is 2,400. So again, I'm going to reach for my calculator to type in that. So 19 divided by 50 multiplied by 2,400 gives me an answer of 912 times. And there is my final answer. Now, you could also say, just to add on this, that you would expect for it to not to be biased, not bias, that the range of a current number of times should be small. Because again, you want all these numbers, if it's a fair die, they should be roughly the same. They don't have to be the same, but they need to be close enough. And as you can see, it's these two numbers that massively stand out. You've got a massive number of, you hardly got threes at all, and you've got a, a, almost double the chance of getting a five than any other number. So again, sum it along those lines. You don't need to include every single possibility, but again, one of those points would be absolutely fine. And then the last thing to kind of finish up on is that to make any experiment more accurate or the probability to make it more accurate, all you need to do is increase the number of trials or increase the number of people that you've asked. And that's what makes the probability or relative frequency a little bit more an experimental probability a lot more accurate. So for example, if I, let's say, rolled a die 10 times, then there is a chance that I could maybe not get a six at all. So I could get, oh, I'm just about to write six there, so that's not good. Um, so for example, three, two, four, five, three, 
and how many times have I thrown it? I've got one more time, so let's go there. Now those rolls are completely absolutely fine. I'm not going to automatically think that die is biased. However, if I rolled it, let's say a hundred times, then I definitely would expect to get a few sixes. So the more number of trials that you do, or the number of times you do it, or the more people you ask, the more accurate your results are going to be, and therefore the probability is going to be a lot more reflective of what it should be. Now I will put a practice worksheet in the description below that covers relative frequency and a lot of the things that we've covered in this video for you to practice everything to make sure that you've all understood it and it all makes sense.